beginning of the 20th century, cities all over the world were faced with major mobility issues. Vehicles were lining up in the streets, causing enormous traffic jams. And the mere presence of those vehicles was also causing a lot of annoyances for the citizens that lived in those uh, cities. Now, those vehicles in 1900 were not the cars as we know them today. No, they were horse carriages. This is a picture of how Fifth Avenue looked like in 1900s. And as you can see, tens of horse carriages causing a lot of traffic jams. And those annoyances were not carbon dioxide emissions. No, there was literally horse shit everywhere in the streets of New York, causing a lot of annoyance itself. So something had to be done, and that something came from a technological invention. And if you look very closely at this picture, you actually see that invention. Out of the, all these horse carriages, there's one odd vehicle there, and that's a motorized car, a predecessor of the car as we uh, know it today. Now, in 1900s, not everyone really embraced the concept of a car. Some were really happy about it. Some called it the invention of the century, while others could never believe that you could actually delegate the responsibility of a horse which drives and delegate that to an engine, to a, to a motor. Now, the interesting thing of, of all this story is that this is how New York looked like in 1900s, and this is how Fifth Avenue, same street, looked like only 13 years later. So the opponents of, self of, uh, of cars were basically completely proven wrong. And it only happened in 13 years. Now, to some extent, 100 years later, we're not doing that much better. We again are faced with a lot of mobility issues. For example, the average speed with a car in, in London right now is about 19 kilometers per hour. 100 years ago, that was actually about 8 kilometers faster with a horse. And we were having the same problems as well in terms of uh, emissions, carbon dioxide, all still very much a lot of problems. So again, just like 100 years ago, we were having that odd vehicle being, getting popped up from time to time, at least we see it sometimes in the streets, but now it's a, it's a self-driving uh, car. And that self-driving car often gives us the at least the promise of solving some of our mobility issues. You just push a button and that self-driving car will bring you everywhere you want uh, in the streets. And just like 100 years ago, we again have two sides. We have the side that are calling this the invention of the century, and we have the side that would never trust to give the responsibility a driver has, not a horse, but a driver has now, and delegate that responsibility to an actual piece of software. So the question I want to ask you today, which side are you on? Do you blindly trust a self-driving car? Would you be willing to sit with a blindfold on, perhaps with your children next to you, and just push a button and let that car, car drive you everywhere you want? My guess is that most of you would say no. I understand that. I mean, we're hearing reports from time to time about accidents with self-driving cars, very recently even fatal accidents with a self-driving car. So why would you trust that uh, technology? Now, what I want to focus on today, I want to explain you what a self-driving car is, what type of technology it is, and what the real challenges for self-driving cars are in the, in the future. So what is a self-driving car? A self-driving car is, in essence, just a regular car packed with sensor technology, cameras, radars, lay lidars, so front-facing cameras, rear-facing cameras, and a bit of software on top. Now, those cameras are designed to basically replace the ears and eyes of a human driver. And the only thing they need to do is they see what is happening around us, and they need to steer left or right or accelerate or, or brake. And the way they do this is using artificial intelligence, and specifically artificial neural networks. So what is an artificial neural network? It's basically a software piece of mathematical computations which are mimicked like the way our human brain works. Our human brain consists of billions of neurons, and every time we think, 
a bunch of neurons are getting triggered. They calculate something, and they trigger that information to other neurons, which again are getting triggered. Again, they send the same information to other neurons, and so on, and so on. So if I now look at all of you, the light that falls into my eyes triggers neurons, and those neurons get triggered by other neurons, and so on, and so on, until I really know that this is the audience I'm basically looking at. And the same thing happens in an artificial neural network. So there, we build neurons in software, and those neurons also get triggered. We give them a certain input, they calculate something, they trigger it and give it to the next layer of neurons, and the next layer of neurons, and the next layer of neurons, until you get a specific output. In the case of a self-driving car, that specific output is a mapping from the sensor information, so radar, lidar, cameras, and so on, until the actual traffic situation itself. So that's the mapping that we need to do. Now, the really interesting thing of an artificial neural network is that we don't need to program this thing ourselves. No, this thing just works by learning by example. So what do we do here? We give it millions, sometimes billions of examples, examples of how to do the mapping from sensor information to the traffic situation. And the neural network basically learns to configure itself how to do that map mapping, all with the goal that the next time if we drive up a road that we've never seen before, that that self-driving car or that artificial neural network powering that self-driving car is actually able to do the mapping and re recognize that traffic situation, although he has never seen that before, just like the human brain works. And that's exactly what the uh, artificial networks and the self-driving cars nowadays do. They do this multiple times per second. They get all that information in, they see what the traffic situation is, and then they know how to respond to that. Should I wait for that bike? Can I turn left now or should I turn right? Should I accelerate? Should I brake? All these things are things that are happening in a self-driving car in a split second. So that's how the technology at least works. Um, I'd like to give you an overview of the road that is ahead, pun intended, of self-driving cars. So what are the challenges for self-driving cars right now? And at the same time, these are mainly also challenges for artificial intelligence. So one of the <clears throat> challenges we have is definitely to further improve those learning algorithms. We're already quite far in this, so the current state of the art of machine learning of artificial intelligence is able to really accurately describe, based on a picture, for example, what is actually uh, being seen on that, uh, in that picture. For example, in the current state of the art, we're able to explain uh, what's on this picture, and we give that to an artificial neural network, and our artificial neural network will give the uh, following outputs. So a zebra standing in a field of grass. Pretty accurate, right? Now, this works, and most of the times it works perfectly, although, however, in, in some cases, especially when the image is a bit blurry or where there's a lot of light shining in, in the camera, the result is not exactly what you, what you want. For example, the same artificial neural network will actually give, describe this picture as follows. A man standing in front of a store with a clock. Not really what you want. Now, in most cases, and really in most cases, the algorithm actually performs really well, but in a few rare cases, it doesn't do what you want. Unfortunately, that's not what we can afford. In a self-driving car, this task, mapping, recognizing what an image looks like, should actually happen multiple times per, uh, per second. And we don't have the luxury that that algorithm can make one mistake out of 10, or one mistake out of 1,000 even, and say, huh, that's not a bike, that's just a road, let's just accelerate a bit. And that's one challenge of, uh, of self-driving cars. We really need to improve those learning algorithms to be able to do that even in the, in the future. We're already quite far in this, but further improving those learning algorithms is challenge number one. Challenge number two has to do with making these learning algorithms a lot smaller. The current artificial neural networks, and specifically the algorithms I just showed you the performance of, have the best performance when you run them on large data centers. So really hundreds of machines in a, in a data center. 
Um, and if you really want to build self-driving cars, that's not what you want. You want to be able to embed that intelligence and let that system learn by itself in the car itself. So we need to build systems which are able to deploy artificial neural networks on a very small chip so that they, that they can be embedded in a car, that they can be embedded in your smartphone. And that's exactly what we at the research center in IMEC are actually doing. So colleagues of mine are looking at the uh, hardware, I'm looking more at the software, to really build artificial neural networks on a very, very small chip itself. Because that will foster a lot of new applications in the, uh, in the future. So that's challenge number two, making sure that we can build those very powerful artificial neural networks and embed them in a very, very small chip. Challenge number three has to do with connectivity. So the moment we're actually able to connect them, we can foster very new applications. A self-driving car is already able to see a bit further than a regular human driver can do. So radars, lidars have better performance and they're able to see 20, 20 sometimes 50 meters further than uh, a human driver. However, if you really want to build an intelligent self-driving car, we need to look even further. We're interested in what is happening 100 meters ahead of us. We're even interested in what hap is happening 500 or even in the traffic jam, which is happening more than a kilometer away from us. If you want to do that, radar and LIDAR, they won't be sufficient anymore. We'll need to communicate from car to car. So one car should basically monitor what it sees and signal that as soon as possi possible to another car. And that's why we also have a very strong connectivity challenge. We need to build a new type of communication protocol that allows that one car a kilometer away from us to send very reliably to that other car that there's a signal or that there's a danger. And that communication protocol should also be extremely fast in terms of reaction speed. Because our car still needs to decide if there's danger and needs to be able to react as fast as, as possible. So that's challenge number three, making sure that we have a better communication protocol that we can connect all these cars. And the moment we're able to connect all these cars, challenge number four pops up. And that's doing something with that connectivity. Because right now we've been building large elephants, really big devices that have some kind of intelligence but everything happens remotely in a data center in the, in the cloud. What we need to build are large ants. Large ants, very small devices that also have some kind of intelligence, but by really collaborating together with each other, we can build a much bigger, much better intelligence than what we had in the, in the past. So that's the last challenge, redesigning those learning algorithms so that they're actually able to collaborate with other learning algorithms as well to build an even better form of intelligence and a higher level form of intelligence. And that's exactly what I'm doing in my research group right now. So I'm building a test bed along the uh, E313 in Antwerp, a bit of the A12 and the ringway of Antwerp to really deploy those self-driving cars in the future. We're building the actual connectivity layer, so we're building an infrastructure to allow cars to communicate. At the same time, we're looking at the learning algorithms on top. All with the idea of building and helping to build self-driving cars in the, in the future as well. So that next time, or in 10 or 15, or maybe in 20 years from now, we all laugh at the idea that we had people who could never trust a software to actually drive the car, and we're all very happy to put a blindfold on and jump in our self-driving car and, and drive to where we want. Thank you.